Before we start our specific demonstration, let's briefly introduce IPsec technologies. Let me tell you first what this is not. It is not about cryptography or encryption capabilities of IPsec in detail. And it's not about how to configure IPsec on Cisco IOS routers. It's about understanding the impact of deploying IPsec VPNs on addressing and routing services of the branch router, such as routing protocols and network address translations. So let's use this lesson to get acquainted with the terminology and demonstrate some of the commands we will use in upcoming demonstration lessons. The first question is, how does IPsec VPN relate to our branch office facilities and migration? Utilizing public networks for branch connectivity is a clear trend in defining branch architecture, and this is not initially a security issue. It's related to providing universal connectivity at low cost. The Internet, for instance, is universal enough to accomplish this objective and, in many cases, presents lower costs as compared to private WANs and dedicated connections. There are obviously several issues with using a public network to provide connectivity for private traffic. First, there's the security issue. Universal means that potentially all users of the public network can see our traffic. A second issue is transparency and complexity as it relates to addressing and routing. The question is, how do we give the users of the VPN the illusion of being in a private network while using a public network for transport? IPsec aims at resolving both issues. Our statement here is simple, but it explains why. IPsec is a standard for encryption and encapsulation. It will tackle the security issue by using cryptographic algorithms to encrypt traffic and make it private, while still traversing the public network. Secondly, it uses tunneling technologies to encapsulate packets and create the illusion of a private network. Let's discuss encryption first. As we said, IPsec uses various algorithms to provide the security services. First, confidentiality, so the world cannot see our traffic. And this is probably the first thing that occurs to us when talking about encryption. However, even if no one can see our traffic, they could alter it, which is not good. By changing even one bit of a packet, someone could make a $1 financial transaction look like a $1,000 transaction. That's why IPsec provides integrity services as well. The third service is endpoint authentication. You also don't want the wrong router or other device to connect to your VPN services. So IPsec makes sure that all connected entities are validated and trusted. Encryption is accomplished by utilizing cryptographic algorithms, such as the ones shown here. You may recognize some of these. Triple DES, AES, Advanced Encryption Standard, MD5, and RSA. We could be talking about encryption and cryptography for days. However, let's focus on the impact of IPsec on routing services. That's where encapsulation has an impact. Before we move on to encapsulation, know this. IPsec will only tunnel unicast traffic, not broadcast or multicast traffic. This was a design decision based on the complexity of supporting broadcast and multicast. There are several provisions under analysis to resolve these issues and several others that are currently working in making possible the tunneling of multicast and broadcast traffic. However, keep this in mind as we look at the impact of IPsec in our routing protocol. In terms of encapsulation, the way IPsec provides transparency is by maintaining the original private packet intact and using what we call a public packet to carry the private packet across a public network. The figure illustrates how it works. You can see the original packet reaching the encrypting router. The packet is then inserted as a payload into a larger packet that will be able to traverse the public network. On the other side, the other router will decapsulate the original packet and forward it to its intended destination. Let's take a closer look at this and see the addressing implications. Look at the network. We have private addressing on both sides of the network. 10.2.2.2 on the right and 10.1.1.1 on the left. 
Let's assume the 172.16 network is public. Here's our packet reaching the initialization of the tunnel. The original IP header is maintained. That means the original packet source and destination addresses remain private. That's how we provide transparency to the originator and destination of the packet. The packet is encapsulated and becomes a payload of a larger packet, whose IP addresses will be public. In this example, the 172.16 addresses. This is how the packet is able to traverse the public network. The tunnel appears to be a single link to the other site, and the encryption services of IPsec are actually hiding and encrypting the packet as it traverses the public network. At the other end of the tunnel, the decapsulation process will produce the original packet. We are very close to reaching some conclusions, but first let's try to demonstrate a simple IPsec VPN configuration. Look at our top left panel for our topology diagram. It is worth mentioning that this is not our main demonstration scenario. It's just a simple topology to demonstrate some of the concepts that we have been discussing. We want a basic set of commands that allow us to obtain information from an IPsec VPN deployment and then use it to tune our network services to work with the IPsec VPN services in our branch router. In the small topology, we have private networks 10.1.1.0 on the left and 10.2.2.0 on the right. We will assume that 172.16 is a public network. Because of that, we are performing NAT on router R1, with a NAT pool of addresses that private packets will obtain when traversing the public network, 192.168.1.0. Our tunnel is being established between R1 and R2. The IPsec VPN is pre-configured between R1 and R2 at this point. We want to first identify the existence of the configuration. For that, we need to identify a main component of IPsec VPNs, which is a crypto map. Crypto maps are Cisco IOS configuration objects that group and gather the VPN settings in order to apply them to an interface. Only then, when the crypto map is applied to a router interface, will a router start encrypting and tunneling traffic through those interfaces. The components that comprise a crypto map initially define the type of traffic to encrypt via ACLs, access control lists. These ACLs are called crypto ACLs and are not there to act as a filter in the sense of a traditional ACL. In fact, when a packet matches a permit statement in a crypto ACL, it will be tunneled and encrypted. When a packet matches a deny statement, it will be sent in clear text outside of the tunnel and following regular routing. In our example, the crypto ACL should match packets that come from the 10.1.1 network going to the 10.2.2 network. There's a very good command in Cisco IOS that you can use to display this information. Let's look at R1 and use the show crypto map command. Most IPsec commands start with the word crypto. Show crypto map displays, amongst other things that we will explain in a second, the ACL. This time it is called VPN ACL and is matching traffic it sends through the tunnel. Look at that. It is permitting traffic coming from the 10.1.1 network going to the 10.2.2 network. Remember, there is an implicit deny at the end of this ACL, which means only the traffic between those two LANs will be encrypted and sent through the tunnel. Any other packets will be sent in clear text. In fact, we can use another interesting command to see the encapsulation and decapsulation process. This is a debug command. It is very dangerous in a production environment because it could produce verbose output to your console and substantially slow down your router. However, for the purpose of this demonstration, we will use it. Debug crypto IPsec. Then we're going to ping from one LAN to the other. From R1, we ping 10.2.2.2 and source it at 10.1.1.1. That should match our crypto ACL and initiate the VPN. If we focus on our objective, 
which is to see the impact of IPsec in routing and addressing, we can see that in the result of the show command. The public addressing seen here is between the local router at 172.16.1.1 and the remote end of the VPN at 172.16.1.2. Notice how the traffic that triggered the VPN was traffic that originated at one LAN, 10.1.1.0, and was destined to the 10.2.2.0 LAN that is connected to router 2. These addresses were used for the original packet to be encapsulated within the public packet, which used public addressing to reach the other side. Now let's undebug. We continue with the components of the crypto map. If you look at the top right panel, you will see the next one which is the IP address of the remote VPN peer. This is also part of the crypto map, and it defines the other end of the tunnel. In the example of R1, it will be 172.16.1.2. If we go back to our show crypto map command, we can see that not only do we have the ACL, but we also have a peer of 172.16.1.2, which matches our description. Traffic matching the ACL and going to a peer will be encrypted according to a certain security policy, which defines the encryption algorithms to use. Some examples of these algorithms are triple DES, AES, MD5, and so on. We can see that in our configuration in the form of a transform set called VPN policy. Other parts of the crypto map are other policies such as the lifetime, which means how long a tunnel will stay up, etc. Again, let's focus on the impact of this on routing and the overall structure. Our crypto map has a name. It's called VPN, and it needs to be assigned to an interface. The show crypto map statement will actually show you which interface the crypto map is applied to, which means it is the initialization and termination point of the tunnels. In the end, a crypto map is similar to a funnel that channels all the configuration components shown in the upper right panel to the appropriate interface serving as an initialization and termination point for IPsec tunnels. You first configure the IPsec settings, put them together in a crypto map, and then apply the crypto map to the interface where you want to initiate and terminate VPNs. In finding these crypto map to interface associations, you will find where initialization and termination occurs, and you will be able to identify the interfaces that require additional configuration. For instance, you will learn how to allow for dynamic routing protocols, which is something we will do in the next few lessons. In the example of the diagram, crypto maps are applied to two interfaces at the top right panel. In our topology on the left, crypto maps are assigned to the interfaces connected to R1 and R2. We can verify this by going to R2 and displaying the crypto map there. You can see that we kind of have a mirror image. Our peer is R1 at 172.16.1.1. The crypto ACL matches traffic originating on the 10.2.2 network going to the 10.1.1 network. The crypto map is attached to the interface pointing to R1. Another important component that you must pay attention to is any filter blocking IPsec traffic and preventing the router from initiating and terminating tunnels. As you look at our right panel, you can have ACLs on edge routers like these blocking unwanted traffic on the internet interface, missing the configuration that permits IPsec traffic to come in. In order to build the ACL that allows the traffic, we need to know the components that represent the subset of protocols of IPsec that initiate and terminate tunnels and protect traffic. They are listed here. ESP on protocol number 50. ESP stands for Encapsulating Security Payloads, which is one of the components of IPsec that accomplishes encryption capabilities. AH, or Authentication Header, is an optional component on protocol number 51. ICE or ISACAMP, also known as Internet Key Exchange, 
is on port UDP 500. It is the negotiating component that will allow both routers to negotiate the IPsec parameters. All of them need to be allowed in any ACL that will be configured on these edge routers. Let's go back to R1. Now that we know that Fast Ethernet 0 slash 1 is the interface where the crypto map is attached, we can quickly verify with this command, show IP interface, then FA 0 slash 1, we can quickly identify whether there are any ACLs attached to this interface. Here it is, FA 0 slash 1, and here we can see there is an inbound ACL called WAN attached to this interface. If we display the ACL using show access lists, we can see this ACL is allowing ESP, AH, and UDP 500, ISACAMP. Look at the matches as well, proving that some IPsec traffic has matched this ACL. It looks like we are fine allowing IPsec traffic into R1 to initiate and terminate VPNs. You can see here how we have created a small VPN toolkit of commands that allow you to gather information, determine where the crypto maps are located, and use this information for other services and functions. We've used show crypto map. At the top right panel, you can see the syntax. We've also used debug crypto IPsec. Once the VPN sessions are established, there is another command, show crypto session detail, which we can use. That allows us to see an overall snapshot of the status of the VPN. Look at this. We have the peer information. The session is up and running, as you can see in this status field. We can see the flow section, which tells you about the crypto ACL, which traffic is being encrypted and tunneled, and perhaps for verification and testing purposes, this last section which shows the number of encrypted and decrypted packets. At this point, we sent one ping, out of which four packets succeeded. That's why we have a decrypted packet counter of four and an encrypted packet counter of four. If we ping again, we should be able to see those counters increasing. There's our five packets. We go through the show crypto session detail again, and we can see our packet counters have increased by five packets to reach nine. In terms of conclusions, you can see in the top right panel that we are here to determine the impact of IPsec on other routing services and addressing services. We can gather here that the impact on network address translation is that IPsec traffic does not need to be translated if there's NAT because it will remain private on its path across the tunnel. It's worth noticing that IPsec traffic is not translated into public networks or public pools of addresses because it remains private. The public addressing will be created by encapsulating the original packet into what we called a public packet. In fact, if we display our NAT statistics, we can see that our access list that defines NAT for which traffic will be translated by NAT, is called NAT ACL. If we display the access list, NAT ACL, with a show access lists command, we can see the first line denies traffic going from the 10.1.1 network to the 10.2.2 network. So this pre-configuration is correct. It's not translating packets that are going to remain private in any case through the tunnel. However, it is permitting any other traffic source at the LAN of R1 going to any Internet destination. If we use the debug IP NAT command, again, a dangerous command in production environments. 
then ping again, we should not see anything because that traffic is being exempted from NAT. If we ping straight to the 172.16.1.2 interface of R2, we see nothing because that is not coming from the LAN. However, if we ping it and source it at the LAN interface, this will be traffic that needs to be translated by NAT because it's coming from the LAN and going to a public destination. Then we see the NAT translations there. The conclusion here is that IPsec traffic does not need to be translated into public addresses, which is one impact on NAT services. The other conclusion is the impact on routing. Remember, IPsec will transfer only unicast traffic and not multicast or broadcast. IGPs such as OSPF and EIGRP will not be able to send routing protocol traffic through IPsec tunnels. One solution to this, and one which we will demonstrate in one of the lessons of this module, is to encapsulate IPsec on GRE tunnels. In conclusion, IPsec provides encryption and encapsulation capabilities. The encapsulation capabilities result in a series of direct impacts in branch connectivity in terms of addressing and routing services using IPsec VPNs. Now let's move on to our actual branch demonstration where we will go through all of the steps mentioned at the beginning of the module.